And on this panel, we wish to take a bit of a more long-term perspective and look beyond the 1st or 2nd of February 2016. And um, in order to uh, sort of set the scene, um, let me make uh, three points. Uh, I think on, uh, on transatlantic data flows in general, we all want um, a solution. We all want that on both sides of the Atlantic. And we all need a, a strong framework on both sides of the Atlantic. Our digital economies in the US and in the EU are interdependent. These are all things that we know. And that the trade um, between um, the two blocks are the biggest and the largest in the world and depends heavily on uh, the sharing and transferring of information, much of which is personal data. And I don't need to recall the uh, importance and the crucial role of um, the safe harbor underpinning um, all, of the, all of these uh, transatlantic economic ties. Um, a crucial element in this data-dependent uh, economy is, and this is the word uh, I think we're hearing all the time, is trust. Um, and companies active in the digital economy are aware of this. And uh, because citizens need to trust uh, the services they are offered, they need to have trust in the services they are offered, particularly online. And that is where trust um, becomes a key element in commercial activities. Trust, and therefore data protection and privacy, becomes a selling argument. And uh, companies will want to show to citizens and to consumers that they are trustworthy. So this is my first point. Companies active in different markets, um, European and American, um, have an interest in increased privacy and data protection standards because it is in their um, commercial and economic interest. So therefore, it is in the interest of our economies on both sides of the Atlantic. My second point, we need to um, take, um, we need a long-term framework, a, a, a forward-looking and a sustainable uh, framework that provides the necessary legal certainty because the limbo situation of the past months is detrimental, um, not only from an economic perspective, but also from a perspective of the protection of the personal data that is being um, uh, transferred. EU citizens' data need to be subject to clear and protective rules when um, they are crossing uh, the Atlantic, when the data are crossing the Atlantic. And um, uh, we therefore need a strong framework that is future-proof and durable in, um, in, in, in time. And compared to safe harbor as we know it or as we knew it, um, such framework needs to be stronger in terms of enforcement in terms of judicial redress, and in terms of access to the transferred personal data. And these are elements uh, and some of the questions that I am sure, um, with taking a long-term perspective, this panel will um, try to address. My third point, let's um, move away from a binary uh, discussion. It's not more data protection and less big data. It's not less privacy and more economic trade. There is no hierarchy. Um, while the European Court of Justice has made it clear that economic interest cannot, in principle, prevail over fundamental rights like um, personal data, like the protection of personal data, it is just as much unacceptable um, that we create a legal vacuum and that there is a total absence of a transatlantic um, framework for data transfers. Citizens need to be protected and have effective rights for uh, their personal data and the economy the data economy needs to have a sound legal framework in which to operate. Anyone saying outrightly that there can't be a safe harbor 2.0 or a new transatlantic framework or whatever we want to call it is refusing to recognize that there can be a solution that provides the necessary guarantees and the necessary certainty for future transfers. So in conclusion, we all agree we need a long-term solution and for that we need convergence. So um, I think in the long run, um, what, what we need to try and do is to move away from local or regional approaches to data protection and try and, and, and move in the same direction. And um, given that our values are largely the same and um, based on, on the same um, principles, this um, long-term uh, perspective is what should inform us about what we are doing in the short term. 
I'm supposed to ask a few questions, to put a few questions out there to stimulate the panel. If this has not been enough, I think the obvious questions are um, what the panel would consider to be um, uh, those elements that are indispensable to uh, a robust uh, framework for transatlantic uh, data flows and, and the digital economy in a, in a, in a transatlantic framework given the that gives the necessary guarantees and are at the same time condu conducive to um, a transatlantic economy. And then I guess the general uh, question about the challenges for both uh, industry and policymakers in, um, in, a, in a global and inter inter interdependent um, world and economy where uh, we face increasingly these types of jurisdictional um, juxtapositions. So I think those are um, a few questions that I hope we'll have a very stimulating discussion on and I'll hand over to uh, Vizila for uh, moderating and introducing the panel. Thank you. Hello, good morning. Um, thank you for attending this session. Um, on the panel today we have some distinguished um, speakers who will give their perspective on, on the subject today, which I find very timely. Um, um, so the first, our first speaker will be uh, Justin Antonio Pillai um, from the US government. He, is, um, he just recently took on the role of um, Undersecretary um, for Economic Affairs at the Department of Commerce. Um, in his previous role as um, Deputy General um, Counsel of the um, US Department of Commerce, um, he um, led um, international trade um, dialogues and bilateral discussions, including um, with China and India. Um, so he will um, um, give the US perspective um, on today's um, subject. Um, next, um, we'll um, take the floor, um, uh, will be uh, Chris um, uh, Hoffensberger uh, from the BSA, um, the Software Alliance. Um, um, Chris um, um, uh, works um, on uh, BSA's uh, policy, uh, technology policy, um, and um, uh, has had. Um, um, sorry. He will give uh, BSA's a, a point um, on um, perspective on, on the issue. Um, next, uh, we have um, a member of the European Parliament, Marucha Schalke, I'm sorry for mispronouncing your name, um, um, who has um, uh, been, been a member of the Audi uh, political group since 2009. Um, she's um, from the Netherlands and um, has. Um, 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 she is the spokesperson on, um, um, of the um, intercommittee on, T on TTIP, and so she might have some remarks on, on um, those negotiations as well um, uh, in relation to data flows. Um, and uh, finally, we'll have um, Jeff Jeffrey Robertson, um, who is um, the founder and um, head of um, Dorchester Street Chamber. Ch Chambers. Um, he um, has had a distinguished career as um, um, uh, trial and uh, a trial counsel and um, has been an international judge and um, he um, has argued many landmark um, cases in uh, media and criminal law. Um, so I will um, give the floor um, first to Justin um, for his perspective. Thank you. Uh, Velsa, thank you very much, and uh, thank you to the conference organizers for uh, having us here today. Uh, I really appreciate it, and um, uh, I've been asked to say a few uh, words on uh, the safe harbor discussions. Um, myself and uh, my, my uh, compatriot who's here with me today have been leading a uh, broad interagency team in these discussions for uh, the last two years. And I uh, thought we'd just give an update before we uh, turn to the thoughtful questions raised by our uh, colleague here. Um, with respect to the safe harbor discussions, I guess I'd start by saying, uh, believe me when I say we understand uh, what an important issue this is. Uh, and uh, it's important to the protection of privacy. It's protection, it's important to uh, people's livelihoods. Uh, and their jobs. Uh, it's important in many ways to safety. 
uh, and it's very important to the transatlantic relationship. Um, uh, we, we've committed on our side uh, for more than two years uh, with a broad interagency team with representatives from our national intelligence, our law enforcement, our independent enforcement agencies um, to engage on these subjects in a very broad uh, way to try and lean forward uh, and um, accomplish something here that is durable, lasting, and something that we can be proud of. I thought I'd just talk for a few minutes about how we've approached these discussions for the last uh, couple of years leading up to where we are today. Um, the, the first basic principle we've had uh, since we reignited our, our discussions with the Commission, which have been very productive and we have a very thoughtful team uh, with which we work on the other side, is goal one is to improve the framework, lean in, and to focus on this as a living document with processes that treat it as a living document. One of the themes of our panel today is to talk about long-term solutions. And we have worked to build in processes to make sure that there is a regular dialogue on issues and that we have an ability to improve the framework going forward as there's new technologies, new issues, new policies and laws, and that we keep this dialogue going in the future. And I think that's a very important approach that we've taken. So we've both looked to ways that we can improve it commercially uh, to protect privacy and also create uh, ways that we can have regular dialogues so that it's durable and that we have some flexibility going forward and that we can solve issues incrementally where we have them. The second uh, basic focus we've had <clears throat> has been, especially from the national security and the law enforcement front, it's, it's been very important that there be mutual understanding, real mutual understanding about the broad set of limitations and safeguards that are available and, and applicable to our national security agencies and law enforcement agencies. In other words, we, just, we have been quite focused in making sure uh, both sides understand uh, how restricted and how safeguarded our national security and law enforcement processes really are. Um, and honestly, over two years, I think both sides would say we've made great progress on both of those things. Uh, you know, and then, of course, we've you know, made progress and we had a lot of uh, good, good discussions on these subjects leading up to the ECJ decision in the beginning of October. And in many ways, one of the things that was heartening about uh, when we, we actually read the decision is that the approach we had taken with respect to our, our dialogue with the commission was very similar to the approach that the court took uh, on the issues central to the case. So I thought I'd just talk for a minute about you know, how the case uh, has affected our discussions. Um, because you know, there's two main things that we took away from the case. The first is that the court was quite concerned uh, as, as one reads the decision, about, the, about two elements of the original commission decision in 2000. And that's really the focus of the court's decision, is the commission decision. The first element of that is they were quite concerned about restrictions uh, on, on the DPAs that were put into the 2000 commission decision. And so that's a takeaway we all understand, is that uh, where there are restrictions on DPA authority, that's something that's of concern to the court. The second thing is the court spent quite a bit of time saying uh, that the original commission decision focused solely on the safe harbor framework and did not contain uh, discussions or findings about the operation of US law or international commitments. And that really a finding about adequacy had to really uh, take into account all three of those things and the interaction between the, the three. That if you have something like, and, and this, makes, this makes eminent sense, that if you have a national security exception 
really the limitations and safeguards that apply are a function of domestic law. There needs to be an understanding of what the domestic law is, and there need to be findings about that. So as much as there was a focus on those elements in the court decision, it's also important what wasn't in the court decision, and this is one of the things that I think is just either misunderstood or seized upon in different ways. There are no findings in the court decision about actual operation of U.S. law, and no findings about, uh, you know, either way about how our national security uh, uh, limitations and safeguards work. So if you start from the proposition that the court was highlighting that the commission had not made such findings, they of course didn't rule on such findings. And the reason that was important is because as we've said, for two years we've actually spent an incredible amount of time, including in direct conversations with our national security team, making sure that the commission has a very deep understanding of the safeguards and limitations uh, including, you know, extensive materials and all kinds of policies and procedures, again, within limits, right? And I, I'm, I'm going to have, uh, you'll see my colleagues later on today on a, on a later panel uh, talk about this. But we spent a lot of time making sure that the commission is very well placed to make revised findings uh, about uh, the limitations and safeguards applicable to our national security and law enforcement so that when they make their finding, it's based on the totality of our domestic law, international commitments, and uh, the safe harbor framework. The second thing that I think is important is there's the, 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 this decision really was not about companies somehow um, not following their uh, obligations under the principles. There's very, I mean, there's no discussion or findings that somehow companies are shirking their duties. And we've talked about this, I'm sure, before, but there's not even a history under the safe harbor framework of companies not following their, their obligations under the principles. Bless you. So, I mean, our, 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 our notwithstanding that, we've actually worked very hard on making sure that, as I said, this is a durable framework, that it has uh, multiple paths, that if an EU citizen has concerns about uh, the way the principles were followed, that they, we have provided multiple paths for, and real paths, for uh, an EU citizen to pursue their legal remedies. Um, so um, I guess I'd say two, two or three final things. I hope I'm not going over my time. Um, the first is, uh, you know, I know, uh, and this matters for a lot of companies, so I, I just wanted to talk about it for a minute. It seems like a small point. I think originally there was a focus on a deadline at the end of January, January 31st. As the way the timing is playing out, it's probably actually um, Tuesday, uh, the February 2nd that we're looking at um, as uh, the, the uh, date set by the uh, DPAs and the working party at this point. And as we come up to that date, I'm nothing like taking it to the last uh, couple days, uh, but as we come up to those last couple days, you know, I'd say we're optimistic. Uh, we're optimistic that a deal can be had uh, ahead of that deadline. Uh, there's still work to be done, and we're going to be in, in constant contact with our colleagues uh, from the Commission and others. Uh, but we've, we've done a lot. We've really leaned in. We've really tried to address uh, the, the concerns that we've heard from our colleagues in the Commission the framework set by the court uh, and, uh, and really put together something that is durable and has enough uh, protection so that it's a living document. And we've been buttressed by, um, I think, some terrific work from colleagues around the world, uh, like uh, Jeffrey, who have talked about what some of the concepts like essential equivalence and so forth mean. That, we're not talking about identity of practices, that there are many differences, but that we need to have bridges between them and uh, have a framework that's durable. Um, so I think with, uh, with those points, uh, I hope I've covered the basics, um, uh, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Vassella. Uh, again, my name is Chris Hoffensberger. I'm with 
BSA, the Software Alliance, and we represent a, a, a range of large global uh, software companies who uh, their interest in the safe harbor uh, is, is probably pretty clear. Um, and I think the, the most important thing, and I, what I want to go back to is Ms. Wagner's opening comments, because for us, uh, the safe harbor and privacy regimes are really all about trust. Um, we see data uh, at the heart of the, the, not just the digital economy going forward, but um, the economy of all countries around the world. Uh, we see data innovation as uh, really driving uh, life-changing, you know, you know, economic-changing innovations uh, that will benefit all of us, um, inter energy consumption, healthcare, all of these things. Uh, and the safe harbor uh, for uh, companies has really been a way to enable those kind of, of innovations around the world. There's been a, a great deal of attention paid to, to personal data and uh, the data of individuals. Um, uh, but you know, the safe harbor is used by a wide range of, of U.S. companies to transfer um, all kinds of data uh, and things far away from uh, what is in the headlines. Uh, and so that's why we've been working uh, very closely uh, supporting Justin uh, and, and the Commerce Department team's good work and the, and the good work of, of the commission negotiators. Um, for several months now, and, and what we have been calling for, what we have hoped for, uh, is a quick resolution, uh, uh, the finalization of a new uh, safe harbor agreement, an updated safe harbor agreement, um, uh, uh, a transition period uh, in order that uh, the 4,000 companies, uh, more than 4,000 companies in the U.S. that use the safe harbor uh, can ensure uh, that their practices are, are properly aligned with whatever changes uh, on hopefully February 2nd. Um, and then uh, that we start all of this, uh, as the panel really uh, wants to discuss, with an eye toward a long-term uh, uh, durable uh, uh, framework, uh, something clear and consistent uh, for companies because uh, as the Safe Harbor was challenged, I'm, I'm sure Safe Harbor 2.0 or uh, 1.5 will be challenged as well. Um, and uh, companies expect challenges uh, to model contract clauses, to binding corporate rules. Um, these are the rules that have been uh, established in the European Union for, for companies to use to, to move data. And um, if these things are under constant assault, uh, in the coming years, what that really is is, is an assault on, on user trust. Uh, and that, uh, I think, is uh, an assault on the growth uh, of digital innovation and the digital economy and, and uh, the economies of, um, of all of our countries. Uh, we, we believe that um, updating the Safe Harbor framework um, made good sense. A lot had changed since it was uh, first implemented in 2000. Uh, we appreciate uh, the, the goals of uh, commerce and the commission of a, a living document that is reviewed annually. We think that makes sense um, because really uh, privacy safeguards, consumer expectations uh, are shifting as well. And these are all things that, that we should come back to. Um, and I, I mentioned companies uh, wanting to make sure that their practices are online and that transition period will be Im important to them. Uh, and then the notion of, of a new deal, uh, something that will, will hold up to scrutiny, is really important to us um, because of this, uh, and, and I look forward to Mr. Robertson's, Robertson's discussion of this notion of essential equivalence that the European Court of Justice set out, uh, this comparative analysis of our respective regimes. Um, the ECJ pointed really sharply at uh, US surveillance laws uh, and their impact on, on individual privacy. And balancing those goals is a task uh, that we think the US, we've been urging the US uh, to take up and consider. Um, we've seen uh, the enactment uh, of the USA Freedom Act, which uh, did a lot to improve personal privacy protections. Uh, Judicial Redress Act has been ha passed by the House uh, and advanced in the Senate. Um, and we think those, uh, those are positive steps, and, and BSA is working hard um, in support of those things. Um, 
Ultimately, however, uh, I think essential equivalence and the pursuit of protecting privacy uh, in a changing world is going to be a dynamic concept, um, something that will change as laws and practices evolve, as digital trade evolves. Um, BSA members uh, uh, aim to be diligent. Uh, they are diligent in ensuring that personal privacy is fully respected uh, and also that robust security measures are in place uh, to protect uh, the data uh, at the heart of the digital economy. Um, but companies really can't uh, and shouldn't be expected to update <coughs> compliance mechanisms um, uh, every few years, uh, each time um, that the um, this equation sort of shifts. Uh, what we are hoping for is, um, uh, uh, you know, the safe harbor lasted 15 years, um, and we are looking for something that will have uh, the same sort of uh, stability um, and will be a, an enduring solution for the future. Um, I, I believe, um, having worked in this space for quite a while, that the U.S. and Europe are really not as far apart on privacy as uh, some would argue. Um, and where there are gaps, uh, whether perceived or actual, um, we, can, we can close those uh, through a continuing combination of dialogue, um, domestic uh, legal reform, um, and international commitments. And uh, I look forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you, Chris. And uh, Marek? Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everybody. I hope uh, uh, you're ready for a lively discussion. What I wanted to do is because I looked at your program and I saw that safe harbor has really been the buzzword this week. So I thought I would just broaden the discussion a bit. One, because I've not been a part of this negotiating team and others have more to say about it. Uh, two, because I take a broader view of the transatlantic relation. I'm the vice president of the US delegation of the uh, European Parliament. So I go to the US often and I look very broadly at the transatlantic relation. And besides uh, my work in the European Parliament, where I also deal with technology issues as a layer of almost everything we deal with, I serve on the Global Commission on Internet Governance, where we have much more of a forward-looking approach to all questions related to Internet governance and what solutions in the long term might look like. So just uh, some thoughts. I fully agree that trust is key and that we have to restore trust in the transatlantic relation. Um, the transatlantic relation, in fact, I believe must be given meaning for a next generation. We tend to forget what the foundation of the transatlantic relation today is, which is really built on the shoulders of the generation of my parents, what we call the baby boomers uh, in Europe, the people that were born at the tail end of the Second World War. And uh, these people fundamentally consider the, uh, the US as liberators of this continent. Now, a lot has happened since then, and I'm afraid that many younger people would not come up with the word liberators first when asked about the United States. But they have other associations uh, with the US and the transatlantic relation, and I believe that uh, the digital economy or the digital ecosystem, the uh, uh, online space that younger generations live in, can be one of those places that can give meaning and uh, cement relations between people, whether it's economic or people to people, cultural uh, and even political. But some uh, steps have to be taken to make this digital environment more robust, to restore trust not only between people, but between people and governments, between governments and of course uh, for companies to know uh, what they can expect and what is expected of them. Um, and so I believe we're in this together and we should work together. Um, but when you listen to the discussion, you often get a different impression. I believe that there's too often a frame of this whole debate as though the US is on one side, the EU is on another side, and there's a huge divide running across the Atlantic. And my experience has been completely different. I am lobbied every day for stronger fundamental rights protections by American civil society, American companies, and even by people who are in government. So I reject this whole division as being between the EU and the US. I think this is fundamentally a political decision where political decisions have to be made on both sides. 
and the differences in where the emphasis should be, what uh, is acceptable as security measures or intelligence gathering measures or what is not acceptable is running as a divide right through our societies. Uh, think about the divisions uh, in, in thinking between Silicon Valley and Washington DC, for example. This is not necessarily a divide between the EU and the US. And so uh, the other claim that we often hear, which I think has been unfortunate if we look at the aim of restoring trust, is that EU measures to protect people's fundamental rights are somehow protectionist. In other words, driven by economic motives to keep out American companies. Now, I certainly don't think that that is the case. Uh, and in fact, I think that the need for governments to protect the fundamental rights of their citizens as the government's responsibility to protect national security is something that the US government can and should identify with. And if it would be American citizens uh, being treated the way European citizens were uh, in the past as a result of intelligence gathering and other national security measures, uh, I believe many people in American government uh, in, in the House and on the Hill would actually propose similar measures as we have uh, on the European side. And so I think that there uh, is now a moment, and a lot of work gone into the Safe Harbor uh, review is leading in that direction, to take a much more integral approach. Uh, one lesson learned is that go different government agencies are not always on the same page, and this too creates confusion and conflict. Uh, another more integral approach should be the one between security and fundamental rights. We should really do away with the zero-sum assessment that more security means less fundamental rights and vice versa. Uh, and if there's one key lesson uh, that underlines this is that the weakening of encryption with the aim of gathering intelligence has backfired in an unprecedented way. It has had consequences for business, it has had deep consequences for trust, and I think the question of whether this has made uh, the United States safer or more trusted can be answered by a no. So what do we need more broadly? Transparent uh, and clear checks and balances, particularly as the role of private companies in the digital economy is becoming greater and greater for critical functions, for securing infrastructure, for keeping data, processing data, in fact, as a layer of almost every service and almost every function that governments rely on more and more too. So it has to be clear who bears responsibility for which functions and how these um, chains of command, if you, if you uh, want to use that term, or these uh, relations of responsibility are uh, handled and embedded in clear laws and regulations. Now, views about what a country can do uh, in, um, with respect to protecting people's rights and freedoms is not only a matter that we discuss on the EU level, it is also, uh, for example, agreed in the um, uh, services uh, agreements at the WTO, so it is not an EU uh, invention to think about uh, the need for countries to take their own measures to protect people's rights and to protect data. It's also um, part of WTO agreements. And I think that this international or global perspective is becoming more and more important. Uh, because we are much more interlinked and because the digital economy is essentially a global one, we should instead of focus on our differences, really uh, try to also take this international perspective uh, and look at what the leadership of open societies and democracies can mean in a global digital economy. I believe claiming to be a democracy should come with responsibilities and I also believe that the greater the role is that companies play, the more people their services and products impact globally, the greater their responsibility to also keep that in mind. And I think if we look outside of the transatlantic space, towards what's happening in Asia or towards what's happening in the eastern neighborhood uh, of the EU, we have a lot to be concerned about. Um, measures that are impacting the economy, uh, for example, data localization uh, requirements, but that are also uh, along the same lines impacting uh, the liberties of the people living in these countries. And the risk of seeking to bring the open internet and all the uh, rules and regulations back precisely to match 
national territories would do away with the enormous opportunities that the open internet, that should be a global internet, uh, actually can bring to so many people. And I believe that both the US and the EU, in any measure that they take or that we take together, should keep in mind that our credibility in addressing some of these very negative uh, measures in other countries is at stake too, that we must lead by example. And so uh, let me just end there uh, with my introductory remarks. I think we together have to raise the bar, uh, raise the bar towards our citizens, uh, raise the bar in terms of uh, how principles uh, can stand firmly and robustly despite the technological revolution. And I don't think it's difficult to agree that fair competition is healthy in the digital economy, that national security has to be protected, but that the laws in providing for the measures to do so should also be clear, transparent, and have the appropriate checks and balances. And that uh, users or consumers or citizens, from whichever angle you want to look at it, uh, should have a prominent role and have to be protected against the overreach by both companies and governments, which we've unfortunately seen too much of in the past decades. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maritou. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, Jeffrey, it's your turn. Thank you very much. It's great to be here to see so many of my old clients. <laughs> Duncan Campbell, I defended 40 years ago he was charged with offences carrying 30 years imprisonment under the British Official Secrets Act because he dared, he was the first journalist who dared to investigate an utterly secret organization called GCHQ. It was actually a crime to talk about GCHQ in those days. And of course, a little later, Annie Matchen and David Shaler, who exposed the fact that MI5 had files on most of the Labour cabinet uh, members, uh, they were whistleblowers who, again, came up against national security laws, criminal laws that put people in prison. It was in those days, of course, before uh, iPads or email or even fax machines, uh, I learnt how to, to, how to find out that my telephone was tapped. I just didn't pay my bill. And of course, in Britain, you're phone is not cut off if it's tapped. So uh, the state's appetite for information in Britain was greater even than its appetite for money. But we have now, and of course I acted for The Guardian in respect of the Edward Snowden allegations, what they could print, what they couldn't, and I had the great pleasure of acting for Julian Assange. I still do. So I'm one of those people whose communications are intercepted. They're intercepted in America by the NSA, and they're intercepted in Britain by GCHQ. Uh, they're intercepted, no doubt, by a number of uh, organizations, signals intelligence organizations in Europe. And actually, I'll tell you this, I have no doubt that my communications have, are treated with much more respect in America when intercepted by the NSA than in Britain when intercepted by GCHQ. For this simple reason, that post Snowden, America has instituted a great number of reforms. They've got an oversight board, which is actually independent. They have uh, inspector generals, general counsel. I've read their recent reports, and they are, in fact, in fact, far more respectful of privacy in the national security area than Europe, which has uh, really no protection at all to speak of, in fact, against national security interception, and with the killings in Paris, uh, is unlikely to have any. In Britain, we're talking about, we have a new bill allowing bulk interception warrants of metadata, exactly the kind of uh, behavior which has been banned in America by the Freedom Act. Uh, we are talking about uh, bulk collection for national security purposes under a warrant given by a politician, a Home Secretary, not by a judge. Uh, so let's take a cold, hard look at Schrems, which produces the extraordinary proposition to those of us actually in the business that Europe has something called high-level protection of 
privacy in relation to national security cases, which must be weighed against the seemingly inadequate protection that is given in America, and that we have to find an essential equivalence and that America is found wanting. This ain't the truth. This is intellectually dishonest. America may not have high level protection in national security cases, but it's got some. Europe has no level protection, and I can prove that and will uh, as quickly as I can. And so what, what a massive intellectually dishonest result from this little court in Luxembourg, which I've appeared in. Uh, it is mainly a tariff, a commercial court. Uh, the most famous case I was involved in was uh, the German sex doll case, when uh, a German sex doll was allowed entry into Britain despite uh, its banning. It's a court mainly concerned with tariffs. And when, a few years ago, it was given a human rights role, it simply didn't know how to approach it. I remember doing the first case about the right to dignity, which is the first right under the, what is now called the European Charter. Uh, they said to me, where did this come from? And I said, well, there's the story of the Good Samaritan, there's Immanuel Kant, and the Kantian imperative, there's Porsche's speech and the Merchant of Venice. Uh, it all went over their heads. They, they had no experience in human rights. European human rights law comes from the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. And that is the court where I practice regularly and where I have assessed the principles that have emerged. And they were very good principles in the days when we were telephone tapping <coughs> criminals. Uh, that was great. They were able to have the privacy pillars which required warrants by judges or home secretaries which required data to be processed properly and a remedy if your phone was tapped mistakenly. But come the national security, in the national security area, this court has been utterly permissive. It has a doctrine called the margin of appreciation and it's given each state the right in national security cases really to bend the law in relation to uh, allowing secret surveillance. Now, how did Schrems come to this idea that Europe had high-level privacy protection, uh, which had to be weighed against the low-level privacy protection in America? I, I think that, well, I've, I've read the judgments, and I think the essential mistake was this. In 1995, when we had the European Directive on Privacy, great directive, it began in its preamble saying, that European states had a duty to seek, I emphasize seek, high level protection, that's where the word high level comes in, uh, for their citizens in relation to privacy. Great, but it's an aspiration. And in the case of national security surveillance, which is the particular area dealt with by Schrems, uh, it doesn't, it hasn't worked because although the European Court of Human Rights in a number of cases, most recently against Hungary, in December a case against Russia, has identified a number of what I might call privacy pillars, the things that states should do in national security cases. The first, obviously, is to have a law which defines the people against whom secret surveillance must be used. The second, obviously, is to have a judge or some independent uh, person giving the warrants to, to uh, secretly survey. Another is that the data must be protected and can only be transmitted uh, where necessary, where strictly necessary. Another is that the target should be notified and should have some remedy. Now, uh, these are important principles, but they have never been applied. The, court has never said that uh, it's a breach of Article 8, which is the privacy article. And uh, there was a report last year by the European uh, Union Agency for Fundamental Rights, very important report, Intelligence Services, Fundamental Rights, Safeguards in the EU. And let me read just one passage from it. It concluded that there is, quote, no uniform understanding of national security across the EU. It said 
that in many Council of Europe member states, bulk untargeted surveillance by security services is either not regulated by any publicly available law or regulated in such a nebulous way that the law provides few restraints and little clarity on these matters. According to this report, only five states have laws applicable to signals intelligence intercepts. And in general, I quote, national legal frameworks lack clear definitions. So the problem with European law in relation to national security surveillance is that the court has not required any particular safeguard, even the basic safeguard of judicial approval of a secret surveillance warrant has not been insisted upon. You don't get that in England because, of course, the British prefer to have these warrants given by politicians. Uh, and so do the Secret Service, because politicians merely rubber stamp the applications that they get for secret surveillance. So I think that ultimately, at the end of the day, the value of Schrems is not as a mind how you go to America is not as a critique of American surveillance policies, which have improved remarkably since Snowden. The Freedom Act struck down the uh, metadata collection, which was outrageous, was contrary to the Constitution, contrary to the Fourth Amendment. Uh, the uh, President Obama in January uh, 2014 issued a directive that foreign nationals were to be treated um, equivalently as far as possible. And of course, some foreign nationals always were. The Yakuza agreement countries, Australians, Canadians, New Zealanders, and British, always received preferential treatment in uh, practice in American surveillance. And it wasn't extended to Europe. Uh, to Europeans. Now that extension has been made as a matter of rule, as a matter of practice, although not uh, as a, in, in a law as such. So in practice, uh, your data, European data, is in my view safer in America against national security surveillance than it is in Europe where there are no uh, forced safeguards. There are no um, safeguards which are insisted upon. We've had two cases, one in Ru one Russia, one hung Hungary, where the court in Strasbourg has said there are no protections at all. Any Hungarian and any Russian can be the subject of secret surveillance, and that is a breach of Article 8. But what the court has not said is that European nations must have independent oversight, must have judicial warrants, must have remedies. And of course, it's difficult enough in this age of uh, ISIS terrorism to have warrants that are, go for only 90 days because you have to sometimes look at people for years to see who they're grooming or who they're, uh, uh, is being groomed. You have to, um, giving a remedy requires some form of notification, you don't notify people who are being spied on in order to assess when they're going to grab a Kalashnikov and, and murder people in a Paris cafe. Uh, these, and, and what emerges is that American NSA work uh, has helped in one or two cases to avert atrocities in Europe. So I think the public are uh, not inclined to support restrictions over broad restrictions on the acts of the security services. So the answer is oversight and privacy um, advocates need to look at the great conundrum, the great paradox of national security safeguards. Namely that the people who are in one or two countries put on oversight boards tend to be people who've been inculcated into the culture of the security services. They're not watchdogs, they're part of the operation. And even some judges, when they're appointed by politicians, tend to be those who are protective of the security services. The great problem 
for privacy supporters is to find patriotic skeptics. The patriotic skeptic who is not abetted, who is not part of the, has not been part of the security service machine, but who is able to put uh, an independent eye. Because security services have done dreadful things. Uh, one only has my generation will never forgive the French for sinking the Rainbow Warrior and killing uh, a Greenpeace member uh, and getting away with it. Uh, in Britain today, we have a secret, secret policeman who would task to infiltrate uh, some uh, animal rights activists and not only infiltrated them, but impregnated them. And uh, there are currently large awards being given for the children uh, of these uh, secret policemen. Misconduct in Australia, the, the, the tapping of the telephone of the president's wife, uh, you can, uh, virtually any country has secret service mistakes, has morally perverse decisions. So there must, oversight there must be. There is no question of that. Even poor old General Petraeus was the victim of a metadata uh, <laughs> discovery that he once, that he had a, a, a mistress for a few months who was his biographer and this was deemed uh, by the Americans to disqualify him from becoming head of the CIA. Betray us, will betray us. Uh, the Puritanism of uh, American culture. But that would, in Europe, I suspect, be regarded as, uh, as a, a, uh, a breach. So there you are. Um, one, uh, as a practitioner in the field, I think Mr. Schrem's great contribution will be to force us in Europe to own up to the fact that we don't have high level protection in national security cases, we have uh, no level protection. And that while America is not all that great, and I criticize the FISA court particularly for its secrecy, uh, it is at least ahead of Europe in terms of providing the necessary safe safeguards for protection in this national security area. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very interesting remarks. Um, I just wondered if I could um, turn the panel's attention to um, what companies have had to deal with. And um, there was a poll um, this week showing that um, quite a significant number um, of companies who were um, self-certified um, to the Safe Harbor Agreement had shifted um, to uh, binding corporate rules and uh, models uh, standard clause, um, model contract clauses. So um, I just uh, wanted to um, ask you whether you think that these are um, sufficient uh, alternatives um, when it comes to da data flows, um, if they um, secure consistency and um, and uh, stand uh, the test of. Um, the courts. Um, and another question I just wanted to throw again. Um, I think, Law, you um, said, uh, you asked the question, what are the key ingredients um, for a long-term stable um, solution and framework for the transfer of the US, UN, um, uh, EU, um, EU data? Um, if you could um, list maybe three words, um, that would be, um, uh, yeah, maybe a hard task to do, but um, maybe Chris, you could start. Absolutely, and thank you. Uh, so, um, so yeah, so a lot of companies have, um, with the uncertainty over the safe harbor, have, have quickly uh, mobilized and moved, um, or at least are, are trying to consider um, uh, model contract clauses and binding corporate rules uh, in order to ensure that they can continue to, to move data. Um, and uh, the, the problem or the, or the concern that they have there is um, how this was a, a difficult um, and expensive task um, even before the Schrems ruling. Um, we've seen statements from DPAs uh, regarding uh, reluctance to approve new data transfer mechanisms. Um, we expect challenges to those uh, data transfer mechanisms. So there, there is a lot of concern um, that, that even some of the, the um, objections raised to Safe Harbor will, will undermine um, these other uh, more, um, uh, uh, well, what we had hoped were more durable data transfer mechanisms in the future. And um, it's, it's not clear what exactly the fate of those will be. Um, and, and I guess to your, to your next question, um, you know, uh, clarity, um, transparency, um, consistency, uh, might be the, those are the three words that, that come to mind. Um, predictability. Um, 
and durable. I'll throw a couple others out there um, uh, because um, we do believe, um, uh, as Ms. Shaka mentioned, um, that digital trade is really important um, to our, our bilateral relationship um, and that it's uh, important to the growth of economies. Um, and, and we hope that we can count um, on uh, being able to move data to, to help um, you know, businesses and consumers alike. Thank you very much. Um, maybe you could um, come in. Uh. Well, I, I just think it's interesting to pick up on some of the points that Mr. Robertson made, which uh, I agree, uh, you can only lead by example, and the EU has a, a pretty poor track record when it comes to practices of different member states. But that also touches upon one of the key points of where we stand right now, that there are some areas uh, that are dealt with on the EU level for the entire European Union alike. Uh, for example, the telecoms package that has just been agreed with rules on net neutrality, just to give you an idea. But national security is still dealt with on the national level, i.e. 28 different times. And so what we see in Europe is a patchwork of rules. And part of what we're trying to do with the digital single market is to make one set of rules, which should make it more predictable and easy to navigate also for American businesses. And I believe, therefore, it is sometimes unfortunate that these measures are labeled as protectionist because, first and foremost, they are intended to break away the barriers between the 28 um, member states, perhaps not everywhere, because I think national security will be the last one uh, to go. Um, but first and foremost, it's an opportunity to make the digital single space or digital single market more predictable and more harmonized uh, across the EU, mirroring the single market offline, which uh, friend and foe agree is quite a success of European cooperation. Now, on uh, elements of, uh, uh, of what next step should look like, what we haven't talked much about, but what I think is important is the distinction between personal and non-personal data. Perhaps others can say a bit more about that as well. And in the words um, that uh, Mr. Robertson just uh, shared, you know, there is, there tends to be, I think, a big, bit of a mixing of um, measures that are taken in the name of national security, and we can argue whether they are legitimate, justified, and embedded in the proper uh, laws and rules, and economic transfers. And of course, what has happened is that mass surveillance has gone into these economic transfers to scoop out uh, uh, data, and therefore there has been, let's say, poisoning of the digital trade and digital economy by national security measures. Um, but I believe that each of these have to be dealt with, you know, very specifically, and that too often they are uh, um, mixed up. Uh, and then one last element which I think is key is consumer protection. Uh, sometimes these are very high level, broad scope um, measures where we have to keep in mind that consumers and citizens have rights such as right to redress and uh, right to access to information uh, and their fundamental rights protected as well. And so too often I believe we risk having a very high level discussion without coming back to the individuals um, that this is all about. Um, this discussion, so in the middle of a lot of these uh, uh, discussions we've been having over the last couple of days. In, in D.C., <clears throat> you may have heard there was a giant storm uh, over the weekend, and we got two to three feet of snow. So in the middle of discussions yesterday, I got a text from my wife who's, who said, my six-year-old boy came in and said, um, Mom, uh, school was canceled, I lost two teeth, and I found a penny. It has been an awesome day. <laughs> and it, it made me laugh because I think fundamentally we're talking about a lot of legalistic things. I think we could take a pretty straightforward, simple approach to a lot of these issues that I think all of us are talking about and get to many of the same points. Um, when you get to the fundamental analysis that the court is talking about, it, that we're talking about uh, with the commission, you know, I don't think anybody should look at this that we have to have identical frameworks. That's not what the court set up. And what they're fundamentally talking about is, do we have basically the same level of protections or better uh, than what's going on in Europe, right? That's what we're looking at. And I think what Jeffrey and all of us are, t are saying is, 
if you actually look at what is on the ground, and this is why I'm optimistic, <clears throat> fundamentally. You have, with our national security side, everything from a presidential directive that talks about signals intelligence, a, a, a independent oversight board that is publishing long reports. Um, you have published policies from all of our intelligence community elements. Uh, and that's just on what the standards are. And then, I mean, so I've, I've served as a criminal defense lawyer, much like Jeffrey, and I know the restrictions under which the government operates because I've practiced there, and they're really, really quite strong on the United States side. But I've also had the luck of serving as one of the senior lawyers in a government agency. And in term, I think if you talk to any of us, we'd be shocked to hear we're not subject to oversight. If that is something true, I'd like to know it because we have multiple levels of meaningful oversight to make sure that the rules are followed. We have independent inspector generals who do both audits and investigations. We have, the, we have Congress you know, that looks very carefully at what we do. Um, we have all manner of processes in the United States to make sure we're following the rules. And this is why, as I said, when we've been trying to explain and get to the points that all of us are saying, fundamentally we have a great story to tell and we're hoping that we get there because we, we really do meet these standards. And the same is true fundamentally. We take privacy incredibly seriously in the United States. We just do it in a slightly different way. And so part of our challenge is, you're bridging different laws and different practices and different enforcement agencies. But different's not better, it's not worse, it's just different. And so we are trying as best as we can to bridge in a positive way. Um, wow, that is, <laughs> that's notice, that's notice. So anyway, I will just say, um, you know, we, we're optimistic because we have really been trying, we've put multiple, and we get how important this is because for the points that have been made about certainty, you know, businesses are really, not, I mean, not just businesses, but the people who work at businesses, the jobs, the livelihoods, the, you know, safety, they really do depend on cross-border data flows. It's really important, and the companies and the people that are going to pay the consequences if we are unable to bridge these gaps are, are really quite significant. And I, I couldn't agree more that this is an important matter uh, for us to demonstrate trust between the EU and the United States, and I think we have a good basis to do it. If I could just briefly respond, because you know I think it's, it's good to celebrate where checks and balances and judicial oversight work well, but I also think it's fair to say that not so many programs would have had to change over the past couple of years if there wasn't reason for that. I mean, there's a reason why we're sitting here and talking about trust. And it's not because everything is going well. And again, I'm not interested in pointing fingers from the EU to the US. What I'm, what I'm saying fundamentally is that this is a discussion that runs through our societies and that in open societies, in democracies, we have to give meaning to our principles even as technologies change. And they will continue to change faster and faster every day. Uh, but I, I do think that there were problems that uh, had to be addressed. Uh, otherwise, Snowden would not have had uh, such, uh, you know, spectacular attention for the revelations because then it would have been, you know, uh, business as usual, which it wasn't for many Americans and Europeans and global citizens alike. And so uh, I think what we're seeing now is, is perhaps a, a catch-up uh, of, of measures that were not in place to make sure that the appropriate measures were, were there uh, and the phenomenon and, and you know, just to um, uh, put in sort of a, a, a Dutch uh, proverb, which says trust or, or good reputation comes by foot but leaves by horse. I mean, the damage that is there, whether it's uh, founded in absolute fact or facts or whether it's also a perception of uncertainty that people experience in the sense of not knowing uh, what authorities, governments, or intelligence agencies have, what technologies they have, and what the consequences could be. It may take more time to restore that trust than the time it took to destroy that trust. We are, owe our belief in privacy to the Americans. It was put in their constitution, not in the French revolutionary documents, but there it was in 1791, the Fourth Amendment, uh, as a result of the use of general warrants by British troops. In 1896, Brandeis and Warren in the Harvard Law Review 
gave us the first intellectual jurisprudential approach to privacy. We in Europe didn't pick up on this until the 1970s. And um, Maritza made the very good point that the European Union, the 28 states, have no rights in relation to national security. That is reserved to the independent states. And that is why privacy in relation to national security is so diffuse and so ignored still in Europe because every country has a different approach. And the European Court in Strasbourg, which is the guardian of privacy for a wider set, 49, European countries, including Russia and Turkey and Azerbaijan, who would never get into Europe, uh, has not been able to develop uh, the basic privacy standard of saying warrant by an independent judge, because in France and in Britain, uh, the politicians won't have that. They want to give the warrant. So it's that basic issue has not been confronted in Europe. It has not these standards. And the Americans are going further. There's a terrific uh, development in the FISA court. They've got a court, which is seven judges um, who are appointed by the Chief Justice, so they're independent. And they, get, they, they have introduced a privacy advocate, someone who will be present whenever they make a decision, who will argue the case for privacy. We haven't got to, the European Court of Human Rights hasn't mentioned that. No one yet has advocated that in Europe. That's how far behind we are. So let's uh, accept the principle of Schrems that there should be essential equivalents, uh, and let's try to get some level of protection against national security surveillance in Europe. I think we have a full house, so maybe you'll grant me 30 more seconds to conclude this session. I, I just want to uh, make three more points, um, and thank you everybody for an extremely interesting discussion, and I think if there was no uh, aggressive bell ringing, we could sit, still sit here for another um, hour or day um, at least. So just, um, it just sounds from the last uh, few interventions as if um, a long-term solution is very easy because the essential equivalence is there in the US, so I think all we need is transparency and put that in the next uh, future framework. So I don't see any difficulty there. Probably one of the difficulties is that we have different approaches in terms of how we regulate. I think there's more of an ex post approach in the US and more of an ex ante approach in the European Union, which I think is where maybe sometimes we have a, a different starting point. And all national security, which of course is a, a national competence and other European competence, um, and when there is an exception to fundamental rights because of national security is not a blanket or unqualified exception, it always has to be justified in, from a perspective of principle and necessity. I think on the, um, of proportionality and necessity, I think on looking at the Schramm's judgment, we can certainly um, discuss this um, at length and, and, and it's an extremely interesting and important judgment, but we should be looking forward. Uh, it is here. Uh, we have to deal with the consequences, and uh, it's uh, not done, um, uh, and, and that uh, from, a, from a personal remark, um, uh, from, a, from a little court uh, in, uh, in, a, in a country, it is done from the highest court of the European Union in a, in a little country. Uh, which is the only Grand Duchy in the world, uh, I may add. Um, but um, so that, I think, from a U.S. perspective, the Supreme Court of the U.S. also, I think, stands a certain authority, and that same authority should also be granted to the European Court um, of Justice of the Union. Um, a, few, a couple of conclusions, very rapidly, uh, 25 more seconds. Um, the, uh, the digital economy is evolving and so should any framework that is um, uh, framing the, 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 the data flows between uh, the US and the European Union. We need a living document is what I think I will retain, a, a continuous and continued dialogue and exchange uh, uh, to understand each other better, to uh, have more predictability in, uh, in the rules and the conditions that, uh, that govern these data exchanges. So. Um, the, the key word in all of this is trust between governments, intra-EU, but also EU with third countries, uh, between governments and companies, between governments and citizens, and between citizens and 
governments and citizens and companies. So there are three elements and all, I think, the trust and the dialogue is important for all of them. And I would agree finally with what uh, MEP Srake said, that uh, this is not a zero-sum game. And I think together we can lead by example because I think uh, there are other parts of the world where um, we, uh, I think, uh, stand pretty good uh, in, in general. So thank you very much. I hope uh, you enjoyed this discussion. And see you.